Knowing that you are not so well because of the change in the weather and also because of the check lag, I wonder how much time you will be willing to give for the question and answer session. You see, when I deliver my Nobel Prize lecture in 2000, I was very glad to hear that according to the custom for Nobel Prize lectures, no question exists at all. <laughs> but of course, I can, I, can, I can answer for some questions. So now, floor is open for questions. We will have some piece of paper to distribute for you to write out the questions so that in case of need, I may have to summarize some of them. But to start with, any volunteer from the floor? Hmm? He's from Finland. From Finland, yes. okay. Our neighbor. Yes. Your uh, very good neighbor. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's a peculiar way to volunteer when your president orders you to ask a question. <laughs> Pardon, just repeat, do not overestimate my English knowledge. What overestimate? I am required to volunteer I see. on order by our president. Okay. It, it sounds like the Finnish military. <laughs> Maybe, but because I am from Russia, when our president volunteered for something, we just obey. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I'm doing. Uh, Professor Alferov, very, thank you very much for that interesting uh, lecture. I know that in the audience, m most people probably do not have a background in uh, uh, condensed matter physics. Uh, I do have some, so I listen with interest. And the thought that kept on occurring to me all the time was that uh, from the viewpoint of our engineering institute, one of the biggest problems with lasers in general, and of course also with double heterostructure, semiconductor lasers in communications, one of the biggest difficulties is stabilization of the central wavelength of the carrier itself. This is a major challenge at the moment affected by variations in carrier concentrations, by variations in temperatures. Do you have some thoughts on what are the possible future directions in order to convert such optical carriers to the same level of stability and usefulness as the carriers used in radio communications? From principal point of view, from principal point of view, what I was telling to you about quantum dots, because it's just the generation of light from isolated atoms, it must be the coherent properties can be, like in gas lasers, for instance. But there are plenty of technological problems, because the ensemble of quantum dots is ensemble and right now it's very difficult to get the same size, the same order. For instance, when we are calculated threshold current density for this kind of structure and compare with the experimental results, the experimental results respond to the 10% variation of these parameters, which is now exists for the best samples in the laboratory. In principle, yes, this is the way. One peculiar thing that practically quantum dots lasers, it was uh, not so simple task for quantum wells and uh, just usual double heterostructural lasers to get single uh, mode operation. Single mode operation in this kind of laser immediately, practically. But in general, I, I, I could not answer. Is the transition sufficiently stable that it would not vary with temperature? In principle, yes. In principle. Because according to the theory, you must have T0 uh, uh, 
which we cannot have. <laughs> yeah. It's no variation, the absolute temperature, stable threshold current density in these kinds of lasers. T0 for conventional lasers depends on the wavelength. For instance, for the wavelengths near to one micrometer like that, for it depends on the properties of crystals and so on, it's usually about 150 degrees. For this quantum dots laser, we were getting 500, but never get zero. No, I actually meant the, tra the lasing transition. No, the from, lasing transition, the you see, the lasing transition in the both cases, uh, of course, absolutely different here because you have in quantum wells, in just in bulk double heterostructural lasers, you have transition between the bands. In this case, you have the transition between the energy levels, yeah. like in atoms. But from this point of view, yes, principally, yes. But it's a very long way to do that. And uh, if I may still continue? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, can there be... One more. <laughs> since since uh, you mentioned that, uh, and I know my colleague here, uh, Dr. Dutta, may have comments on that as well. Um, since these are man-made structures, as you yeah. mentioned, as compared to... God-made. Uh, God-made. Yeah. Um, can they be tailored, really, to be uh, matched to 1.55 micrometers yes. for, for transmission? Because yes. in that case, it becomes, of yes. course, extremely interesting also yes. as an amplifying yes. device. Yes, yes. We are getting recently the quantum dots lasers with the wavelengths. There is some difficulties, just from point of view, not principal one, just from point of view to find out good material for quantum dots. And for the most developed and well-known system, gallium indium arsenide, it's very difficult as, as a limit, this wavelength, but we got recently quantum dot lasers with very good parameters with the wavelengths 1.46, oh. and I hope in short time we shall get Should there. Yeah. Thank you very much, and I think after this our president will never ask me to volunteer. Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much for, Monopolizing. Very, for very good question. I have received a number of questions here. May I start with the first? Would you please comment on quantum computing devices in contrast with semiconductor technology? I am not a specialist in computer, so I can say only just general words. So it's, it would not be a qualified answer for this question. Nobel Prize winner also not qualified in any areas. <laughs> Another question. Seeing you have been working in semiconductor physics for 50 years or more, what do you think about the future of the field? And the future of? This field, semiconductor. semiconductor. Yeah. And uh, may you comment on the high TC superconductivity after the discovery of I don't know, MGB2. No, 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 just repeat to me. <laughs> I don't know what this means. Oh, magnum B2. Uh, no, you see, it's great future for semiconductor materials and semiconductor physics. And Tyson, from the, what I told you about quantum dot physics, it's clear, absolutely. About high TC superconductivity, uh, okay, it was very fast development when Bednarz and Müller discovered the first high temperature semiconductor materials in Zurich. Then it was fast development and the temperature grew up, up to I think 130 degrees like this or 140, and then it stopped. And there is general rules. Then something stopped for a long time there must be two reasons. Or, we are going to wrong, by wrong way, or it's connected, we do not understand well the phenomena which is going on. 
Uh, maybe, maybe, I don't know. I am personally never work for her superconductivity, only I read the paper, sometimes discussed different things. Maybe it's the limit for this kind of high temperature superconductivity materials, and maybe it can be possible to find out some other ways. It's long time recognized that in general the systems which looks like wires and interaction between them can principle give to us the new limit for high TC superconductivity. But it's very difficult to say when and how it happened. I remember last year in 2003, two Nobel laureates from Russia appear more than I, academicians Ginsburg and Abrikosov. I know both of them very well, and I remember uh, both of them are working in the area of theory of superconductivity, and I remember that Ginsburg said when this, it was announcement of the high TC superconductivity, he told just even before that maybe I came to know about this discovery not from physics journal but from newspaper. It's really happened. And now it's difficult for me to say what about this material, I don't know. Thank you. A question from Dr. Ahmed, please. Thank you, Professor Vian. Professor Alferov, uh, I was a student of telecommunication in Leningradsky Elektrotechnitsky Institute Sviazi. Great! <laughs> <laughs> so, I have pleasure... Bonj Burevich. I mean, Bonj Burevich. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. Magu Nimnoshka Gavaric Paruski. <laughs> it's okay, we shall <laughs> discuss by Russian. <laughs> but uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, because my background is also Russia, so even if the president does not order me, I have to perform. <laughs> okay? <Yes. laughs> so I just, uh, before coming to your lecture, uh, I was discussing with my senior colleague, Professor Sharma. We are in the same telecommunications yeah. program here. And uh, we were think, talking about this miniaturization of things. Now, because of the miniaturization, for example, already I think it is technologically possible to have, a, say, a PC in your button and uh, the screen on your, yeah. like, eyeglasses yeah. and like that. So this PC and this power of information technology already have made us quite unsocial. And now when we are going to have all those miniaturization and everything belong to me, my body, and I, am, I can interact with the whole world through surfing and everything, how much we would remain as a social animal? You see, so it's very what, what is your uh, opinion no, about this? It's very difficult yeah. question. I am, <laughs> I am socialist, but not social scientist. <laughs> um, I can answer only by very simple way. The every discovery has positive and negative results. In principle, for instance, the discovery of nuclear fission and nuclear fusion is a very good discovery. But we got of negative results from here in environment, in danger of the nuclear war and so on. Definitely, you are absolutely right that creation of this miniaturization of the information technology devices gave to us a lot of new interaction and interaction noise, which is definitely terrible to the brain. But the 
Recept ca can be only be careful about applications of these scientific and technological achievements. Yeah. Thank you. There's another question from Dr. Dutta. Maybe last Us. one. Okay. So I think I'm the lucky one. <laughs> uh, continuing with the miniaturization, we have been talking about the red brick wall since the time I was a student. It still hasn't happened in microelectronics. In your opinion, that you are looking at the quantum dots, when do you think we are actually going to work with the quantum dots when we talk about transistors? Oh, you again put very difficult question. <laughs> because principally, tomorrow, technologically, maybe 10 years later, Okay. Is that the last question you are allowed to have? I think yes. <laughs> okay. So. That was the last question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So Your thank you very much. was the last. And I give you answer. <laughs> May I now invite Provost Professor Mario Tabucano to have a word of thanks. It has been a great honor and privilege for all of us to have the opportunity to listen to the very excellent, fascinating lecture of Professor Goris Alf Alferov. And first of all, on behalf of the Institute and all of us who are here, we thank the International Peace Foundation for the uh, excellent support and sponsorship of this lecture series. This is the seventh now. When we started uh, last year in November, this is the seventh in a series of lectures delivered by Nobel laureates and eminent uh, persons uh, around the world. And we are greatly honored. We thank uh, the, the foundation. Uh, Professor Alferov, uh, with his stature and wealth experience, could have selected any other topic. Uh, I'm sure he has numerous topics uh, uh, to give lectures to, to the audience. But I think the topic that he selected is very appropriate uh, for us here at the IIT, to the audience, especially that many of the members of the audience are students of our School of Advanced Technologies. And I'm very sure that the students, the members of the faculty, have learned a lot from the one-hour uh, lecture. When we talk about electronics, IT, of course, trends are very important because uh, the technology is changing so fast. And it is important to take stock of what happened in the past, what's happening, and what's going to happen into the future. And uh, the very technical, very heavy topic of the presentation was made a little bit lighter by the excellent sense of humor of uh, the speaker, which we very much appreciate. Uh, I noticed also that when he started his uh, slides, it was all pure Russian, Russian, Russian language. And then all along, it became mixed Russian and English. And then at the end, it was purely, purely English, English language. I could see a trend of the field also getting into the internationalization, globalization, where English is the medium of uh, uh, communication. You see, uh, Professor Alfaro brought us back in time into 1945. It is only a matter of one lifetime, that's 59 years from this year, where the development of uh, transistor, the development of solid state amplifier and semiconductor really took off the ground. And he was so uh, uh, good in telling us as to who were responsible for such developments. So from 1945 to 1959, it was a matter of 14 years where the second major discovery and development in the field took place in 1959, when the first uh, silicon chip was uh, produced, discovered, which became the, the foundation of the current uh, silicon technology 
59 to 62, where there was another very important uh, milestone in, in the field where the PN, the PN uh, junction laser and LED uh, took place. And then you have noticed in the presentation the many developments that took place almost yearly uh, with uh, his own contributions in, in uh, super injection in, in hetero junction as new materials for semiconductors are so astonishing and uh, very, uh, I would say, propelling as far as electronic industry is concerned. He also gave us uh, uh, some background as to the development of, ke of chemical wafer and the, the, the technology that went into hetero, uh, hetero structure microelectronics and the current quantum dot uh, laser. So with all these developments and going into the future, I think uh, the Asian Institute of Technology, the students, the members of the faculty will, of course, uh, remember your, your talk uh, uh, here uh, today. And we hope that maybe in the future you'll be able to give us again the opportunity and pleasure of your presentation. So on behalf of all the members of the EIT community, the sponsor, and uh, those who are listening also on internet, I would like to express our profound gratitude to you, uh, Professor Goris Alfarov, and would like to ask the President of AIT, Professor Jean-Louis Armand, to give and present a very symbolic, uh, uh, modest but symbolic uh, present to our Nobel laureate speaker. May I invite the President to and speaker to please come and present this token of appreciation, which Nermon uh, is going to present to the President and to Professor Alfarov. Thank you very much. Now we have a reception, and we all divide it. But if I just say a few words, you know, after it, it's very difficult after Provost, he's such a good speaker, is how much we appreciate it, as you see, Mr. Provost, this sense of humor of our speaker. He's also a very generous person. We had a chance during lunch and afterwards, you know, to appreciate how generous he is, to appreciate how interested he is in AIT. He didn't know AIT too much before coming. Now he knows a lot. He's extremely impressed. He sends his best wishes to all of you, all of us. But I would like also to share with you a few things I learned. You know, it's uh, about, if you just allow me to say that, if you connect on a website of Nobel laureates and you connect on a website of Professor Alfirov, you have you have written your own biography, and I wish that all of you, after this lecture, after the reception, could look at what he has written. It's, it's a wonderful biography. You learn a lot about the 19th century, the 20th century. You were not born in the 19th century, but the, the, it starts in the 19th century. Your father, who was, as you say, a revolutionary, very proud of it, and he named you Jaurès, after Jean Jaurès, as you <laughs> very aptly mentioned, but you had an older brother, and this is a very touching part of the story, who he named Marx, and your older brother was killed during World War II at the age of 20, and as you write beautifully, he will be 20 forever, and this is so touching. I just wanted to share with you, you know, it's a wonderful biography, and it's wonderful to see that you can be a scientist and you can have a heart. Thank you. <laughs> 